reading quietly in my little alpine meadow here um, an extraordinary book which I read many years ago. This is just a short little thing and what I'm going to uh, mention is not it, it, it springs from the book rather than is, is the book itself, but it's a book called The Germanic Isle and it's it's subtitled Nazi Perceptions of Britain. I wrote a review of it in the Herald about 20 years ago. It's an absolutely fantastic book and it's one of the books I often take down and from my shelves and look at again. It was written by somebody called Gerwin Ströbel. Uh, it's published by Cambridge University Press in the year 2000. British life was the ideal of the Nazis <laughs> and uh, it goes through all sorts of things like uh, um, Himmler's obsession with actually to the extent of preparing a book about the way the way Sherlock Holmes caught his criminals um, in order to introduce the um, the SS to more sophisticated detection techniques and so on and so on. It's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary and it's fascinating. But he says, just thinking about this area here, he says above all there was there was the emphasis on rural life and ambivalence about cities. It just struck me as rather modern, even after two centuries of industrialization. And the sounds of the smithy and the sight of the ploughman coming over the crest of the hill to which Baldwin was so partial and which he wrote about in the essay that the RSPB constantly quotes as one of the characteristic sounds of England as being the corncrake in the dewy morning um, uh, to which Baldwin was so partial would have appealed just as strongly to the East Elbian Yonker who kept a picture of the Kaiser in his study throughout the Weimar years and to the Nazi elite who did not. The strength of this attraction can be sensed even across the decades in the memoirs of a man like the SS protégé Reinhard Spitzi, who came to London as Ribbentrop's assistant. And that's a, a book we will definitely uh, encounter at some point. How We Squandered the Reich, one of the most amusing accounts of life as an SS officer in the, uh, in the, in the uh, London Embassy. Um, one of the most amusing accounts of life as an SS officer generally but he happened to be in the London Embassy and wrote about Ribbentrop's absurdity and how he killed the British respect for Germany by his weird carryings on. Strobel goes on to say, in the early 30s, when they were still being kept from power by President Hindenburg, the Nazis that is, uh, an estate-owning Prussian conservative distrustful of social upstarts, this was but a dream, the kind of life that Spitzi saw in, in Britain. I've skipped over that. It was a dream, however, which in due course would, would, would bring about from Goering, who at Caron Hall somehow managed to combine vulgarity with panache, to the egregious Arthur Chrysler and the Nazi palladianism of the country seat he built for himself in occupied Poland. This fondness for the trappings of rural life would in turn give rise to misconceptions in both countries. A series of photographs of throughout the 30s of British politicians and German leaders enjoying country pursuits either separately or in each, in each other's company, as in the case of Lord Londonderry shooting with Goering, would suggest to the German public a reassuring symmetry in the British and German national lives. In Britain, meanwhile, the magazine Country Life would select for a photograph of Hitler at the Berghof the caption, A Countryman at Heart. Now, I tracked that article down, finally, in the Mitchell Library, and it, I keep it in the back of this book here because this was written, or published, on March the 28th, 1936. And it's written and illustrated, it says. Uh, it's called Hitler as a Countryman, and it's subtitled The Squire of Wachenfeld. Written and illustrated by Ignatius Fair, spelt P-H-A-Y-R-E. Now, I'm not a suspicious-minded man, that sounds to me like a pseudonym. So, here we go. Hitler as a countryman. Of all the world's uncrowned rulers, I would name the head of the German government as the most indifferent to social lures and the greatest devotee of a tranquil rural life amid beautiful surroundings. Life in Berlin does not appeal to Herr Hitler. The motor fumes there affect his delicate throat. 
He has long suffered from a tumour in the vocal cords on the right side. Let me say at once that Herr Hitler has keenly artistic tastes. He paints in watercolours. He, has, uh, he had early ambitions to become an architect. And as for literature, one remembers him as the author of a colossal bestseller. I mean his political testament, Mein Kampf, which sold three million copies. It is from the royalties on this work, which is known as the Nazi Bible, that this shy, retiring man was enabled to extend and develop his ideal Bavarian home. What is now Haus Wachenfeld, a cosy but modest chalet perched at 2,000 feet above Bertelsgarten, was formerly just a peasant's cottage where Herr Hitler was cared for by his widowed sister, Frau Angela Raubel. With his gradual rise to power, that rude frame shack blossomed into a villa. Later on it was added to and ornamented by its owner. More and more land was also acquired, and with it some village property. Today, quite an estate is laid out in these mountain slopes. The inner sanctum, with the chalet itself, is surrounded by um, barbed wire. <laughs> the people love them so much. And armed guards keep off well-meaning admirers and excursion visitors who flock thither from all parts of Germany. Now, bear in mind, this is country, li country life in 1936, trying to present Hitler as a, a kind of, you know, a, a, a gent of a Germanic sort. Quite extraordinary. I'd be interested to know what the reaction of the average country life reader was to this. Uh, it, it goes on. It is here that the leader holds his most important cabinet meeting for which his ministers are summoned by air from Berlin. The only ladies who are ever invited to the chalet are Frauen Goering and Goebbels. It is well known that Herr Hitler shrinks from feminine society. And then he describes the lake and the beauty of the Koenig Zee, or the Lake of St. Bartholomew, and he always takes his guests there, acts as his own Schiffmeister, and um, it shows people the caves, feathery waterfalls, and finally the little chapel shrine to St. Bartholomew himself. At Haus Wachenfeld, Herr Hitler spends his happiest hours. The big solarium here, with its striped tent umbrellas and little tables set out in the balcony, is used by Der Führer as an all-season dining room. Although a lifelong vegetarian himself, neither smoking nor drinking wine, the host keeps a generous table for his statesman guests while confining himself to meatless dishes such as potato pancakes, milk soups, cinnamon rice and the like. After lunch, all adjourn to the big tripod telescope outside. Here, Herr Hitler will indicate the salient points in a glorious landscape of immense range. As sun goes down and darkness creeps on, the faint lights of Salzburg begin to twinkle. And so on we go. To the final page, Ignatius Fair goes on to say, Haus Wachenfeld is necessarily the political citadel of the head of the German government. Here he is often abroad, soon after dawn, clad in plus fours and with his retriever, Muck, or, he, or else his trained Alsatian, Blonder, trotting at his heels. One or other of these will be carrying on his back a little hamper containing tomato sandwiches and fruit with a couple of bottles of mineral water. Now, I rather like that. There's the Fuhrer getting his dogs to carry his lunch for him. I don't know whether he, Herr, Herr Fair thought this would appeal to the British reader or not, but um, I think it's quite amusing. Then, amid the pines, or in some commanding knoll beside a cross and a wayside shrine, sadly there's no crosses and wayside shrines in Campbelltown, but um, anyway, there we are. Can't have everything. Amid the pines, or on some commanding knoll beside a cross and wayside shrine, Herr Hitler will sit down to ponder his problems and his speeches. Just like I'm doing here, except I'm not pondering problems or speeches. It is not easy in, for this devoted man to shake off political obsessions which have become a sombre religion to him. Yet his love for an open-air life is very real. So also is his yearning for the Volksgemeinschaft, or companionship of the people. In my hungry days in Vienna, he told me, as we sat at coffee on the balcony. 
I once saw a placard over a cook shop door whose words I have taken as my life's motto. Dein Volk ist alles, du bist nichts. The people is everything, you are nothing. You know, to the extent that you can call it this, that you, you think of as the propaganda. From country life, of course, don't forget, this is very important. This is, you know, the, the, the British rural elite are going to be reading this. I'd be fascinated to know what they made of it. He goes on to say, Yet a very modest, even a simple, humble soul is Germany's miscalled dictator. He is never so content as when hobnobbing with the guides and hunters of these beautiful hills, or again proudly conducting his guests through the quiet village streets, perhaps to enter a cottage and pet the children, or even to instruct their mother in the food values of vegetarian dishes. A little farming is done here with well-bred stock. The leader also grows wheat and alfalfa. While his cherry orchards are famous all along the Austro-German frontier, this is before the Anschluss, of course. Long ago, Hitler's father, Alois, bought a little farm where he retired from cobbling shoes and collecting petty revenues as a customs clerk at Brunau, on the inn. But he was a failed farmer, etc., etc., and Hitler got more from his mother, Clara. I have said that very few women are seen here as guests. Herr Hitler's views upon the gentler sex are well known, and he has amused himself by writing a sort of decalogue in rhymed couplets for German girls. One of these I may roughly render as, Take hold of kettle, broom and pan, then you'll readily get a man. This one was for professional women. Shop an office, leave alone. Your true life work lies at home. After his long hikes abroad in the morning hours, the squire of Wachenfeld returns to go over the foreign newspapers which are sent him by air from Dr. Goebbels, Alfred Rosenberg and Ernst Hans Stangl. These three censors control the foreign press bureau and the last named is especially welcomed in this lonely, serene retreat. For Hans Stangl is an accomplished musician, and when Der Führer is wearied by public functions in the cities, he will fly home to the green peace of Haus Wachenfeld with his press officer, who will then play the etude and nocturne of Chopin to his pensive chief far into the night. British propaganda skills aren't quite so feeble as they are now.